Lesson 8 Choose Life Sabbath Afternoon November 13 The history of nations speaks to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in His great plan. Today men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of Him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of His purposes. The prophecies which the Great I Am has given in His Word, uniting link after link in the chain of events, from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold as coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history, and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Prophets and Kings, pages 536 and 537. The great captain of our salvation has conquered in our behalf, that through him we might conquer, if we would, in our own behalf. But Christ saves none against their choice. He compels none to obedience. He made the infinite sacrifice that they might overcome in his name and his righteousness be imputed unto them. The soul that trusts fully and entirely in God will never be confounded. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 457 Every soul has a heaven to win and a hell to shun, and the angelic agencies are all ready to come to the help of the tried and tempted soul. He, the Son of the Infinite God, endured the test and trial in our behalf. The cross of Calvary stands vividly before every soul. When the cases of all are judged, and they, the lost, are delivered to suffer for their contempt for God and their disregard of His honor in their disobedience, not one will have an excuse, not one will need to have perished. It was left to their own choice who should be their prince, Christ or Satan. All the help Christ received, every man may receive in the great trial. The cross stands as a pledge that not one need be lost, that abundant help is provided for every soul. We can conquer the satanic agencies, or we can join ourselves with the powers that seek to counterwork the work of God in our world. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 96. Sunday, November 14. The Tree of Life. Though created innocent and holy, our first parents were not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing. God might have created them without the power to transgress His requirements, but in that case, there could have been no development of character. Their service would not have been voluntary, but forced. Therefore, He gave them the power of choice, the power to yield or to withhold obedience. And before they could receive in fullness the blessings He desired to impart, their love and loyalty must be tested. It was the will of God that Adam and Eve should not know evil. The knowledge of good had been freely given them, but the knowledge of evil, of sin and its results, of wearing toil, of anxious care, of disappointment and grief, of pain and death, this was in love withheld. Education, page 23. The fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural virtue. To eat of it was to live forever. Its fruit was the antidote of death. Its leaves were for the sustaining of life and immortality. 
But through man's disobedience, death entered the world. Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of which he had been forbidden to touch. His transgression opened the floodgates of woe upon our race. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above, but its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of Christ, we may still eat of its life-giving fruit. Of Christ it is written, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the fountain of life. Obedience to him is the life-giving power that gladdens the soul. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, pages 988 and 989. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will, the power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve Him. You can give Him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to His good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go, but if you stop here, they will avail nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christians. Steps to Christ, page 47. Monday, November 15. No Middle Ground. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God. His thoughts were pure, his aims holy. But through disobedience, his powers were perverted and selfishness took the place of love. His nature became so weakened through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. He was made captive by Satan and would have remained so forever had not God specially interposed. It was the tempter's purpose to thwart the divine plan in man's creation and fill the earth with woe and desolation. God does not force the will of his creatures. He cannot accept an homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. He desires that man the crowning work of his creative power, shall reach the highest possible development. He sets before us the height of blessing to which he desires to bring us through his grace. He invites us to give ourselves to him that he may work his will in us. It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. God's Amazing Grace, page 313. Each human being is given the freedom of choice. It is his to decide whether he will stand under the black banner of rebellion or under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel. With deep solicitude, heaven watches the conflict between good and evil. None but the obedient can enter the gates of the city of God. Upon those who choose to continue in transgression, the death sentence must at last be pronounced. The earth will be purified from their misdoings their defiance of God. The rules of life that the Lord has given will make men pure and happy and holy. Those only who obey these rules can hear from the lips of Christ the words, Come up higher. In Heavenly Places, page 361. Satan told his angels to make a special effort to spread the lie first repeated to Eve in Eden. Ye shall not surely die. And as the error was received by the people, and they were led to believe that man was immortal, Satan led them on to believe that the sinner would live in eternal misery. 
Then the way was prepared for Satan to work through his representatives and hold up God before the people as a revengeful tyrant, one who plunges all those into hell who do not please him and causes them ever to feel his wrath. And while they suffer unutterable anguish and writhe in the eternal flames, he is represented as looking down upon them with satisfaction. Satan knew that if this error should be received, God would be hated by many instead of being loved and adored, and that many would be led to believe that the threatenings of God's word would not be literally fulfilled, for it would be against his character of benevolence and love to plunge into eternal torments the beings whom he had created. Early Writings, pages 218 and 219 Tuesday, November 16. Life and good, death and evil, blessings and curses. While life is the inheritance of the righteous, death is the portion of the wicked. Moses declared to Israel, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. The death referred to in these scriptures is not that pronounced upon Adam, for all mankind suffer the penalty of his transgression. It is the second death that is placed in contrast with everlasting life. In consequence of Adam's sin, death passed upon the whole human race. All alike go down into the grave, and through the provisions of the plan of salvation, all are to be brought forth from their graves. There shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Acts chapter 24 verse 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. But a distinction is made between the two classes that are brought forth. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. They who have been accounted worthy of the resurrection of life are blessed and holy. On such the second death hath no power. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. The Great Controversy, page 544. In all the dealings of God with his people, there is, mingled with his love and mercy, the most striking evidence of his strict and impartial justice. This is exemplified in the history of the Hebrew people. God had bestowed great blessings upon Israel. His loving kindness toward them is touchingly portrayed. And yet what swift and severe retribution was visited upon them for their transgressions? The infinite love of God has been manifested in the gift of His only begotten Son to redeem a lost race. Christ came to the earth to reveal to men the character of His Father, and His life was filled with deeds of divine tenderness and compassion. And yet Christ Himself declares, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 the same voice that with patient, loving entreaty invites the sinner to come to him and find pardon and peace will in the judgment bid the rejecters of his mercy, Depart from me, ye cursed. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 In all the Bible, God is represented not only as a tender father, but as a righteous judge. Though he delights in showing mercy, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet he will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 469. God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure fit for God's service, but we can choose to serve God 
we can give him our will, then he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus our whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. The Ministry of Healing, page 176. Wednesday, November 17. Not too hard for you. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength, purity, and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. He is waiting to strip them of their garments stained and polluted with sin and to put upon them the white robes of righteousness. He bids them live and not die. God does not deal with us as finite men deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy, love, and tenderest compassion. He says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 and chapter 44 verse 22. Steps to Christ, pages 52 and 53. The faith that is unto salvation is not a casual faith. It is not the mere consent of the intellect. It is belief rooted in the heart that embraces Christ as a personal Savior, assured that he can save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by him. To believe that he will save others but will not save you is not genuine faith. But when the soul lays hold upon Christ as the only hope of salvation, then genuine faith is manifested. This faith leads its possessor to place all the affections of the soul upon Christ. His understanding is under the control of the Holy Spirit, and his character is molded after the divine likeness. His faith is not a dead faith, but a faith that works by love and leads him to behold the beauty of Christ and to become assimilated to the divine character. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 to 14 quoted. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 391 Commit the keeping of your soul to God and trust in Him. Talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in Him. Put away all doubt. Dismiss your fears. Say with the Apostle Paul, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Rest in God. He is able to keep that which you have committed to him. If you will leave yourself in his hands, he will bring you off more than conqueror through him that has loved you. When Christ took human nature upon him, he bound humanity to himself by a tie of love that can never be broken by any power save the choice of man himself. Satan will constantly present allurements to induce us to break this tie, to choose to separate ourselves from Christ. Here is where we need to watch, to strive, to pray that nothing may entice us to choose another master, for we are always free to do this. But let us keep our eyes fixed upon Christ, and He will preserve us. Looking unto Jesus, we are safe. Nothing can pluck us out of His hand. Steps to Christ, pages 71 and 72. Thursday, November 18. A Question of Worship. There are many who come to the Savior in a feeble way. They receive baptism, and yet there is no apparent change in their character. We would invite all to come, all to abide in Christ, to advance daily in the perfection of character by abiding in Christ. As they do this, 
they find that rest that can come only through perfect obedience. But I warn you, be careful how you settle down in the middle walk between spirituality and worldliness. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You will be holy on one side or the other. Christ draws to his side. Satan hangs out every attraction to draw on his side. Whom will you choose? Under whose banner will you stand? In Heavenly Places, page 277. The first four commandments enjoined upon man his duty to serve the Lord our God with all the heart, and with all the soul, and with all the mind, and with all the strength. This takes the whole man. This requires a love so fervent, so intense, that man can cherish nothing in his mind or affections in rivalry with God. And his works will bear the signature of heaven. Everything is secondary to the glory of God. Our Heavenly Father is to be ever cherished as the first, the joy and prosperity, the light and sufficiency of our life, and our portion forever. Let men worship and serve the Lord God and Him only. Let not selfish pride be lifted up and served as a God. Let not money be made a God. If sensuality is not kept under the control of the higher powers of the mind, base passion will rule the being. Anything that is made the subject of undue thought and admiration, absorbing the mind, is a God chosen before the Lord. Sons and Daughters of God, page 56 Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. Man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due him, of that do we make a God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 305. The Lord desires that those who come to worship him shall carry away with them precious thoughts of his care and love, that they may be cheered in all the employments of daily life, that they may have grace to deal honestly and faithfully in all things. We must gather about the cross. Christ and Him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God, and when we realize His great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The soul may ascend near heaven on the wings of praise, God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above, and as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 3 Steps to Christ, pages 103 and 104 For further reading, The Upward Look, Right or Wrong Side, Which, page 140, and The Faith I Live By, Life or Death, page 71.